It's really a pleasure to be here tonight and to, to speak about a topic that I'm, I'm very interested in, spent a lot of time in, and I'm passionate about, which is fintech. Um, as Todd said, I was in, in Hong Kong for five years. I spent most of that time on the mainland in China. I spent a lot of that time, particularly the, the latter half of it, uh, dealing with uh, fintech in, in Asia, both the startups and the, big, uh, and, the, and the bigger fintech giants. Tonight, I want to spend time on uh, talking about what I think the drivers are of fintech in China, who the players are, look at their models, and then maybe offer a few words of where we go, where, where I think things will go from here. And I'll try to contrast that with the U.S. as, as I go through it. The presentations uh, that I think have been handed out, and um, I'm not going to go through them page by page. I think I'm going to try to, try to anchor my comments to five or six pages. Um, but when, when we get into Q&A, we'd be happy to talk about some of the other, uh, you know, anything you see in there that we haven't otherwise covered. And I'm going to go, actually, I'm not going to go anywhere yet. Um, just as a preface, um, and, and uh, I apologize for this being uh, elementary for most of us, but, you know, fintech is a big deal in China and is growing very rapidly. Three of the top six fintech companies by market cap or implied market cap are in China. And I'll spend a second to just define these or, or lay these out because we're going to come back to them over and over again. One is Ant Financial, which is uh, Alibaba's affiliate and which just raised money this past summer at $150 billion U.S. valuation. Uh, the second is Tencent. And, and unlike Alibaba, which has spun off its fintech business into Ant, Tencent's fintech business is embedded inside of it. Um, and it, it, it mostly in two places. One is uh, WeChat Pay, its payments business, and the second is its um, ownership stake in a bank called WeBank. And those are the two primary um, uh, fintech businesses inside of Tencent, but still very much part of Tencent. And those, um, you know, have probably have a market value of over $100 billion. And then the third um, uh, in the top six globally, number six, is a business called Lufax which is a wealth management and uh, uh, lending business, uh, internet le online lending business, mobile lending business, um, started by uh, Ping On, which is an insurance company and very, very uh, forward leaning generally in fintech and has started a number of successful fintech businesses. So these are, these are, these three that I named are, are uh, ser they have serious global ambitions. They've achieved rapid, they've achieved large scale quite rapidly. They are large enough to undertake basic technology R&D and then apply that to their business. So they're very active in AI, blockchain, big data, IoT, cloud, and, 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 uh, and as I said, they're big enough to um, do their own research and then, then, and then make it an important part of their business. And they've, they've all developed sophisticated use cases and tight integration with, with a whole variety of of, uh, of, of commerce and, uh, and social media partners uh, in China. And I just should note, this, this is in the con all this is in the context of a very active China, sec China tech sector overall, where there's been a ton of uh, uh, startups, private placement activity, and, fin and IPO activity. Um, there are more uh, unicorns in China than there are in the United States, and they, they form about twice as quickly uh, as they have in the U.S. And, um, and so, so, so this is in, in that context. I'm also going to talk about startups, of which there have been many in the fintech sector, and, and I think will be an important part of the fintech sector going forward, as well as, um, as what the incumbents are doing, the traditional financial institutions are doing in this area. So now uh, I'm going to go to slide three and just, um, here we go. And so, um, and I want to talk a bit about how I see the drivers. One is uh, first demographics, as as we all know, uh, China is um, very large, 1.4 billion people, about four times the size of the U.S. Its GDP is about 60 percent of the U.S., but growing at two to three times the rate. Is expected to pass the U.S. in the next decade, in about a decade. Per capita uh, income in China is about a fifth of the U.S., but that gap is uh, closing and uh, is going to narrow um, appreciably over time. Uh, it's projected, and, but, but, but underneath all this, and importantly, 
um, is, is an incredible demographic shift that's going on at the same time. So there's been a tri there'll be a tripling of disposable income in China this decade. Um, continued urbanization, so the, urban is the, the percentage of the population living in urban areas will grow from 48 to 60 percent over, over this decade. The service sector is contributing a greater, greater and greater amount uh, to, to overall GDP. And, and as a result of all this, it's driving uh, the development and, and rapid growth of a middle class in China. And today, there's, I'm not, there's lots of definitions of, of what it means to be middle class in a particular country and how you look at that across countries. But um, it, the, the middle class in China, by a lot of estimates, is about the same size as it is in the US um, right now and growing much faster. So with this emergence of, with, with all of this, and particularly the emergence of the middle class, comes an increased demand for financial services, a big, a large increased demand for financial services. Uh, but, but frustrating this, and at the same time providing the opportunity for this fintech sector, um, is the nascency and, um, and lack of experience and capabilities among the traditional financial institutions uh, in China. So to this slide, this looks at um, banking penetration um, as measured by credit card penetration uh, on the vertical axis, and it shows significantly lower banking penetration in China as well as other emerging markets. And, and then as noted, and, um, and, and this has been my experience, that banks and traditional financial institutions in China are generally not equipped to, to serve this, this, this flood and this evolution of, of the consumer middle class. The incumbents uh, in this area are mostly state-owned enterprises, SOE banks, that have grown up serving other SOE companies making large corporate loans. And, and don't have the track record or experience to, to, um, to, serve, to, to, to serve consumers. And, and there's a lot of evidence that the needs of consumers and small business are not being met. So this, this low level of penetration um, uh, it, it mixed with or, or combined with this rapid rise in the middle class um, uh, and, the reason, and, and, and the reason for the low level of pen penetration being the, the um, the, the inability and the inexperience of the, of the incumbents creates uh, the conditions for, um, you know, for, for the fintech boom that we've, we've seen. The other important dimension and contributor to this is the mobile centricity of, of China and other, um, many other developing markets for that matter. One of my favorite charts to look at in, in Asia was to look at just this chart, the, uh, looking at, um, uh, uh, banking penetration versus smartphone penetration in different countries and from that you, you can you can you know you, you can tell you can tell a lot it, and it's quite interesting to make the comparisons indonesia for example has has very very low penetration about the same population as as the u.s and slightly greater um, smartphone penetration as another example um, and so so th this this is this is another important ingredient when when when, when you look at this, and um, and 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 uh, the fact that there are 900 million smartphone users in China, that e-commerce penetration is so high. In fact, the the gross the aggregate GMV in China is higher than the aggregate GMV in in in, in the U.S. So this confluence of a huge population, growing economy, rising middle class. Low penetration reflecting the unmet need for financial services, payments, checking accounts, credit, wealth management, insurance that naturally tracks to the improved standard of living, combined with a high degree of internet and mobile literacy, I think comes together and creates this, this boom that we've, we've seen and are seeing. This, just a sort of final comment or observation here. This really isn't a disruption uh, a story like it may be in, in, in the U.S., for example, but it's a story of um, uh, mobile and, uh, and, and online models um, being created to serve an unmet need. Um, so in the U.S., as you think about fintech, we think a lot about disruption. We think about companies that uh, lend money to people to pay down their credit card debt or refinance student loans, maybe with a longer-term strategy of building out a broader digital bank. But, but, but mostly it's about disrupting or taking, taking business away from an incumbent. And we think about it, even the most successful disruptors in the US, uh, PayPal and Square, 
uh, both payments businesses, actually are big customers of Visa and MasterCard. They rely on the legacy uh, networks to, to support their business. So in China, it's much more about going after a large and new market, and it's not takeaway business, it's not fringe or niche business, but it's, a, it's really a mobile and fintech first um, response to this, this huge opportunity. So that's, um, so that's how I view anyway, sort of what, what, what is driving this. I want to spend a quick minute on, on the incumbents, um, just very quick. This is, th this is slide six. And so this looks at uh, financial institutions around the world by market cap, and you can see that four of the top 10 are Chinese banks. And I, I would note, actually, that if Ant were on here, and this is just public company, so he didn't put it on, it would be number 10, and Tencent would be on the chart as well. But, but w w when you look at what these banks do, um, and this just goes along with what I said, you know, a few percentage points of their balance sheet are allocated or, 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 or focused on consumer lending. And if you look at a U.S. bank, it's probably five, or five plus times that. Just, just, just indicating the 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 the, the difference in in in, uh, in the in the business. On the penetration slide, if you looked at the data underlying that, there are 275 million credit card holders in China, less than 30 percent of all adults, as compared to 75 percent of the adult population in the U.S. Um, and it, it, as noted, um, the Ch again the Chinese state banks, have, the Chinese large banks have have been focused on other things. More broadly. If you look at the security sector, still undeveloped uh, um, in a lot of ways, the domestic capital markets are still evolving. The largest security firm in China is about a tenth the size of the, of the leading U.S. firms. Asset and wealth management is still in its early days. BlackRock, for example, is a, is a multiple times larger than the entire asset management industry in China. And the insurance sector is, is in the process of being reformed away from being uh, focusing on short-term savings and, and risky investment strategies and, uh, and, and towards more uh, true protection products and sensible investments. One thing I think is important to note is th th this is driving huge fintech um, development, but it's also, it's not going to be just fintech. Th there's a lot of potential for other, other models, traditional models, uh, other incumbents and other you know, more um, terrestrial businesses to do very well here too, just given the opportunity in the different sectors, but a lot of it'll go to a lot of it'll be be satisfied through technology-oriented models. I guess the other way I think about this: imagine we have the technology we have today, but we're it's the 1970s here in the U.S., and that that's kind of what it feels like uh, in China. It's 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 I, I, I guess you can't imagine that, but Todd and I can. Um, okay. Let's go to nine. So this is just a simple schematic of, of the landscape. So I've already talked about um, the, the fundamentals, the, the sort of the drivers, the de demographic shifts, and, 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 and not to belabor this, but um, it, when you, again, look back at these statistics, um, you, you, can, you, can, you can draw the conclusion that there's somewhere between a hundred and four hundred million, pretty probably good financial services customers that are that have or are emerging right now, and that are are are, are well underserved um, uh, by the traditional financial institutions. And it's this pool of customers that uh, potential customers that um, that a lot of the fintech models are attacking. One of the things we'll come back to again is um, the, the the tricky part of this is there's 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 not a lot of data. So there aren't any credit, they're, they're, they're not, the, the, the credit bureau penetration in China is, is, is very low compared to the U.S. and lenders can't really, really rely on, on, on credit bureaus to make decisions. And we think about it, the, the, the decisions they're making are about people who have never been in have very little financial services uh, product usage. And so, um, so that, that is an additional challenge that, that, that is, that is uh, relevant in terms of um, uh, how, how things are evolving. I, I, I think about the, the, the there's a lot of different sub-segments in fintech. I, I, I think the, the four primary ones you think about are payments, credit and lending, wealth management, and, uh, and insurance. And then, um, and then there are lots of others too. And then uh, in terms of players, um, 
we bucket them in three places. One is the internet giants, who, as I said at the beginning, are, are, um, are, are, have, have a big role that they play here and are, 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 are growing very rapidly. And so that's in addition to uh, Ali and Tencent and then Ping On, which, which is not an internet giant, but a factor. Uh, people would also put uh, Baidu and, uh, and JD probably in that category as well. And there'll probably be others as, you know, Meituan and, and other Chinese companies get uh, go public and get bigger and, and uh, look, you know, look, look for financial aspects uh, to, to, to their business. Um, and then startups. So there's, there's, there's been a, an explosion of startups across all these sectors. Um, get into a, a second uh, where that activity's been and what's happened. And then the incumbents um, who, who are, I think, playing catch up now, I think over time will, 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 will play a role as well. Moving ahead to uh, 12. So um, let's focus first on uh, the internet giants. Um, as I said, they're the largest, most successful, and, and, and their, their presence in the financial services sector is, is, is quite different than the way the U.S. has evolved. And I, I would point back to the fundamental drivers in China and how those, those are, at, are at, you know, are, are the situation is different here. One of, the, one of the natural advantages that the Internet giants bring are their very large customer bases and data sets. So when you think about it, you know, Ant started as Alipay, which started at, which was, was formed basically to facilitate payments to conduct commerce on Alibaba's platforms. Um, and over time, they've accumulated lots and lots of transaction data uh, regarding um, both the merchants, the, which is a lot of small merchants, as well as uh, consumers. And, and, and so that's, that's Ant. A Tencent uh, has the biggest um, social, the, the biggest messaging and social media, big gaming, and all kinds of other things platform. There are about a billion users of, of the messaging platforms of, of, uh, of, of Tencent. And so they've accumulated a lot of data, different kind of data than, than, than uh, Ant, but a lot of data there. And then I've mentioned Ping An as well, and Lufax, this, uh, this company. And, and, and Ping An has been involved in credit insurance in China for more than a decade. So they've got data. So I, I mentioned this just because these are great natural advantages that these companies have compared to a lot of the startups who, who need to boot, who, who, you know, day one have no data and they have to figure out a way to, to bootstrap their way uh, into data by partnering with merchants or, 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 uh, or, or, or other ways. Um, I, I just want to, in, in, in sort of hand in hand with the data, I think the, the payments angle is important here. It, it, was, um, it was sort of the seed for Ant and it's been an important part of, of Tencent, on Tencent really starting with P2P payments and then gradually um, um, expanding, expanding from there. And that is a, um, th 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 those are both real backbones to the, the financial services businesses now. E both Tencent and Ant have done, uh, have competed very aggressively um, to uh, accumulate payments, customers and merchants as well. Um, and they've moved, for, and, and, and today they've got roughly combined a 90% market share of the mobile and internet payments uh, uh, market. And, uh, and they're aggressively going after offline payments uh, as well and uh, making their, 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 their wallets uh, usable in, in lots and lots of offline merchants. And they use payments as a way of acquiring customers. Um, they've got a huge scale advantage, um, they're ubiquitous. And, um, and so the, each in their own way don't look to um, uh, generate a lot of near-term revenue from, from payments. And if you, if you talk to Tencent, you know, it's really, they look at it as part of the fabric of their, of their, uh, of their user experience and, um, and, and don't, think, don't think about payments very differently. They don't look at it as something that you have to monetize and you have to figure out a way to make money from because they view it as, as uh, uh, ex coexisting with their broader platform and, 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 and helping more broadly. The, but the, so what that means though is, um, is, is that they look to monetize in other ways. And so focusing on Ant, which is just purely financial services, they want to sell, they, they want to monetize through credit products, insurance, 
Um, they have a very successful uh, money market fund. Um, they, they facilitate uh, bill paying. Um, they have a, a credit bureau that they've built. And so they look uh, to, to um, um, uh, sell, sell customers or, or get their customers multiple products. And that creates a virtuous circle in their, in their business model because the, you know, the more products a customer has or the more transactions they do with a customer, the more data they've got on the customer, the better they can target and price and present propositions you know, the, the better competitor they are, and that feeds on itself. And so that's a, that's a core part of, of, of how they think about it. The other thing to mention here is regulation. We'll come back to it in a while, but there's been, uh, the, as this has developed, there has not been a lot of regulation. And so it, it's, it, the, re, the regulators have been, for a number of years, I think, chasing this and, and trying to play catch up. Um, over the last three or four years, uh, I think the, 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 the government and the regulators have done a good job of coming up with a framework um, and, are, uh, oh, and, and are, are filling in the details of that in terms of um, uh, what the regulations are, who will regulate what area, and, and, and how to do that in a way which, which doesn't uh, suppress, uh, suppress the, uh, the, you know, the growth. So maybe it's worth pausing and comparing all this to the US. In the US, we had more mature payment structure with entrenched players, much harder to cross-sell other financial services products because um, you know people already had a, a great credit card or or a, a, a checking account or or other sources to borrow from or getting insurance from Progressive or Geico and and so it's much harder to 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 to, to sell these different products because it was not a, a greenfield that was you know it was very uh, entrenched uh, companies. Uh, regulation was more constraining. And then we did the, the demographic uh, tailwinds that characterize China, uh, certainly a lot different in the U.S. So, so that's, um, th those are some of the things I think that contribute to the Internet giant's growing position. Um, as I noted, there's, there's also been significant startup activity. Most of it has been, or a lot of it's been in P2P and more generally tech-enabled lending. In addition, um, models that are more tech enablement where, where companies look to um, provide data and analytics and, and cloud services to, to lenders um, but not actually do the lending themselves and also um, businesses that do vertical search and, and lead generation um, uh, in, in the financial services sector. Certainly P2P has gotten the most news. Um, uh, I, I don't know whether it was 3,000 or 4,000 that it peaked at. It's down to fifteen hundred. I hear now, and and that's just an example where the, there were no rules um, for a period of time, and that um, that uh, led to a lot of fraud and a lot of incompetence. I think the regulators have um, over the last few years have uh, gotten their arms around that and are in the process of uh, implementing regulations. I think the, the the challenges they're seeing, particularly with respect to P two P, are one is they've got to figure out a way to have a soft landing because most of these other 1,500 companies, when they figure out what the final regulations are, probably won't meet the standard, and they, and they don't want to cause a, a, a disruption um, uh, by, by um, uh, dampening consumer confidence in these businesses. So they've got to figure out a way to tail that down over time. And they also have a simple resource problem. They need to figure out who's going who's gonna to regulate it and where the resources come from. So they're in the process of that. And I expect by the end of this year, there'll be pretty solid P2P and, and more generally uh, tech-enabled lending regulations uh, in place uh, in China. Um, there's been some activity in payments, although um, one of the byproducts of, of the way the payment market has unfolded in China is Ant and Tencent have been competing aggressively with each other. There's, they've competed the margin out of the business and so uh, it's very hard for, for other, other entrants to a, figure out an angle where, where Tencent and Ant aren't somewhere in the payment scheme and then, um, and then make money just given the narrow, narrow margins. We've seen an IPO of some, uh, a, big digi a big digital insurer and there are some insure tech companies that are gonna come along. I think the, the insurance um, uh, uh, FinTech development will, be, will, will happen more slowly kind of like it, it's been in the U.S. And I think wealth and asset management are, are in very early days. I think there's huge potential there 
both for, for fintech models as well as traditional models. For the incumbents, you know, for the existing financial services companies, you know, version 1.0 is these companies are providing uh, financing uh, or products for fintech businesses. So one of the things that is, has evolved is as, as the P2P um, lending rules have come into place, um, the P2P lenders have looked to come up with more diversified funding models and many of them have turned to banks and banks have gotten into the business of funding. Um, funding. And so, uh, so that would be kind of a low value add participation by incumbents uh, in FinTech. I think version 2.0 is gonna be a lot more interesting I, I could imagine we'd see spin-offs, so in, insurance companies, maybe spinning off uh, fintech-focused insurance companies. Maybe a retailer has got a lot of customer data and and its own sort of financing, you know, business to finance its sales and look to spin that off. Um, I think we'll look. At some of these businesses will evolve to be more more pure tech businesses rather than kind of a, a, a mix and look to. To be technology providers as, as, as to, to, to financial institutions rather than making uh, loans themselves. And then I think you'll see, and as part of that, more complex relationships between incumbents and, and tech companies and fintech companies where it'll, it won't be just a simple partnership. Um, neither will be, you know, the, neither will be dominant. The, the value, you know, the, the, the value channel gets split in a, in a, in a way where both will, will find the business interesting. And, um, and, and so you see more, more complex uh, relationships uh, there. I think you might also see banks coming up with their own tech-enabled businesses, so like Lightstream from SunTrust or, or maybe even Marcus at Goldman Sachs where a, a traditional financial services company creates a brand and a, uh, leverages other, other advantages it has in different areas. And I, think you'll, I, I definitely think we'll see some of the large, um, large incumbents do, do, do that as well. And, and like I said, it's very early in a lot of these sectors. And so um, uh, there'll be winners, there'll be big fintech winners, some of the startups will be winners, and some of the incumbents will be winners in different ways as well. So, oops, I turned it off. There we go. So I wanted to take a closer look um, at, the, um, at Ant in particular. Um, although this, a lot of this applies more generally to the internet giants. So this shows on page 13 um, some of the, 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 the internet giants that I've referred to. It shows the primary players. You just look at the page and see that they're pursuing broad models um, uh, and, they're, they're lever and, and, and this just shows that the, 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 the model is to leverage data and, um, and look to monetize in, 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 in different ways. So Ant is about a third owned by Alibaba now, the rest is owned by Ant Management and investors from three private rounds that they've done. 900 million customers valued, as I said, at 150 billion last, uh, last summer. They said payments is, is their primary way of acquiring customers and, and, uh, and, and they've, they've done that they're the leading mobile uh, uh, payment provider, and they're, they've built a big offline presence as well. They're also significant with small businesses and, uh, and consumer lending. So they fund the purchases, uh, consumer purchases on Alibaba platform and many other platforms, and they also make cash loans. Historically, they've funded using asset-backed securities, but now they're moving more to this bank funding model that I, I referenced, uh, referenced earlier. And that's a big part of where their model's going, and I'll come back to that. Um, they also fund small business loans through their a bank affiliate called My Bank, uh, a bank that they own about a third of, and that's just de primarily dedicated to, to, to serving uh, Ant. In wealth management, they have um, open architecture wealth management um, with, uh, with a lot of products and very strong analytics. They've got the largest money fund in the world, um, uh, uh, Ubal, which is their money market uh, product, and they, they're very clever about this. What, what they, they um, when they set up early, early, earlier in the Alipay days, what they, they set up a money market fund that would, if you had money in your Alipay wallet, you could invest it in the money market fund because deposits were regulated. They were able to offer a pretty safe investment at a much higher return. 
they attracted lots and lots of uh, interest and, and usage uh, through that to the point where they, that is now the largest money market fund globally in the world, and they own 50% of, of, of the parent of that. And the fund functions like a checking account. You can pay bills, you can pay your friends, um, you can move money in and out, and this is important with very low friction. So if you are in the US and you gotta move money in and out of PayPal, and you use your credit card, or even your debit card, it, there's friction, um, much less friction in China, because what both Tencent and Ali did is they built a direct network to the banks. They didn't have to rely on, on a Visa or MasterCard, an established uh, player, and, 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 that, um, and that allowed them to, to uh, really set their own, you know, set their own rates. Uh, insurance is big. They own a controlling stake in Cathay Life, and they've got lots of partners uh, for, for various insurance products. I think insurance is more of a, for simple insurance products, um, it's much more straightforward. So simple life products, auto insurance um, to sell, um, you know, in a fin in following a FinTech model. The harder products are, are um, some of the light, more, more involved life products um, and property casualty products. Um, and what Ant is doing is they're working with Cathay and they're working with others to actually design products that are optimized to, 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 sell, on the, uh, to sell on their platform. They've, they've established a credit bureau um, and they sell credit data other, to other financial institutions, uh, get, and, which is a good business given that there's very low credit bureau coverage in China. And just the cross-sell statistics are pretty amazing. So 640 million out of 900 have two or more products 483 or more, 190, five or more. In 2010, it took 31 months to get their first 100 million insurance customers. In 2013, it took 20 months to get their first 100 million uh, UBAO money market investor clients. And in 2015, it took 11 months to get 100 million credit bureau uh, customers. So a few other points, um, which I think are interesting. One is there, there's this sort of a parallel roadmap here for the merchants. So in addition to consumers, they're going aggressively after merchants. They've, they've um, uh, increased offline merchant acceptance uh, for their payments. But the, the way they say it, they want to be the CFO to merchants. So they want to offer loans and insurance and uh, in cash management functionality, both to merchants and consumers. And, uh, and that's an important part of, of their business going forward. They're pursuing, they're seriously pursuing a global strategy. So given, it, it's interesting, given all the tailwinds have got um, in China at the same time, they are, they're, they're, they're going uh, very rapidly internationally. They're in something like 48 countries right now. They've got 120 million uh, international users. They, they, they have large minority stakes and lots of different partners. Probably the best, biggest, one of the most well-known ones is their investment in Paytm in India which is the largest mobile payment uh, business uh, there. They, they like to frame their business as tech fin, not fintech. And as I said earlier, they're moving more, more towards um, tech enablement and, and away from being a principal. So rather than uh, retain some risk through funding loans, through asset-backed securitization, they're partnering with banks where the banks, where they'll, they'll provide the banks data and analytics and cloud services and, and uh, infrastructure to make loans, but the banks will take all the risk. And, and I think over time, you'll see their business evolve across all their different verticals in that direction. Um, finally, the other thing that's important is they continue to have a strong association with the Alibaba ecosystem, which gives them, um, that gives them each benefits. Um, they've both got global strategies and they're, 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 they're sort of pursuing parallel, parallel paths. Finally, slide 17. So this just maybe gives a bit of a summary of, of the state of play across the three, three different types, internet giants, startups, incumbents. So there's roughly a, a, a billion customers at both Tencent and Ant. When you think about it, they've already got all the customers in China. So now what they need to do is now they're trying to increase ARPU, increase average revenue per user um, um, by selling them lots of products. And, uh, and, and so that's, and, and by expanding internationally. I picked a few start, a couple startups here, Chudian and Genpu. Um, it, it, I could have picked a number of others. I mean, there, there are a lot of issues with some of the startups now who are in the P2P area. Um, 
uh, particularly relating to regulation, which I'll get to in a second. But I, it is amazing. I mean, they've got they've been in business for a few years and got 62 and 84 million customers, respectively, which is about the size of the largest banks in the United States as far as consumer cost, consumer scale. And then the incumbents, you can see the two biggest banks at you know 500. 573 million, 380 million, roughly half the size, and growing it much more slowly than, than the uh, than than the giants or the startups. So finally, um, maybe talk about three forward-looking dynamics. One is regulation. Um, I noted the, the the regulators have put it put in a place an intelligent framework, and now they're working hard to um, implement it. And and as a result, they're they're playing catch up in different ways most um, notably in the peer-to-peer -peer area that I talked about. The other thing they've been doing is they've established a pilot program to regulate the internet giants. And the issue there is the, the, the internet giants are regulated in a piecemeal way depending on their business, but nobody really looks at the consolidated entity. And so they're, they've, they have picked seven or eight um, large companies that are active in financial services and are trying to figure out how to regulate them. At the same time, the companies are thinking about how they can evolve their models away from being regulated. And so this feeds into what I was saying about Ant and moving more towards a tech, pure tech model and, and, and to try to minimize um, you know, their regulatory, regulatory footprint. And I think that you'll, you'll see more of that. Um, I think with credit, um, it's, been, um, there, there been, uh, it's been a very active area it's been a very volatile area as far as valuations go and performance. I think the, the biggest issue there is regulation. And, and when that stabilizes, I think you'll see uh, that sector stabilize. And I think you'll see um, some, 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 leaders, uh, some leaders emerge. Uh, Lufax certainly will be one and there'll be others. Um, the second point I want to make is, is hit on a number of times. It's the notion of bifurcation. I think that this is more of a global comment. Um, I think as, as fintech matures, I think you, you, you're going to see these models uh, evolve either in a tech direction or a fin direction. And what's happening is I think is investors and regulators are getting smarter and they're looking carefully at models that try to have the best of both worlds who try to build, them, build themselves as regulatory light or don't have credit risk or don't have liquidity risk. But when you look at their models, they really do. You know, so, so if you're you're making loans and selling them to somebody else, and you're saying you don't have the risk. Well, you do, because if somebody else doesn't buy them, you're out of business. Um, and so I, I, I think what we'll see is some companies evolve to be much more tech-focused and, 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 and will we'll do, do tech enablement. And others will embrace actually being a financial institution, a, a, a highly technical, technically savvy fintech uh, modern but financial institution, and they will embrace regulation and 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 do a good job at it, and and outcompete uh, the incumbents. And then finally, um, thoughts on prospects for startups uh, and incumbents. Um, I think you'll see. I, I I don't think this is a winner take all for the for the um, for the internet giants for a variety of reasons. I think regulation will play a role in in um, being a natural limiter. I think. Um, Models will evolve in the way that I, I just said. Um, I think there'll be um, parts of the of the population that, that won't be excited about a pure mobile business and want other channels that maybe better serve from other companies. I think there might be, and this is an important point, natural conflicts between some of the incumbent financial institutions who, want, who are in these fintech companies' ecosystems, but where there's a big gray area about who owns the data and who owns the customer and where you know where 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 my business ends and your business starts, and I think the big the big fintech giants are kind of scary to the banks, and so you could see banks looking to work with with smaller, less pervasive uh, uh, companies um, as a result of that. Um, and then I think the incumbents will, like I said before, I think there's a variety of, of uh, tracks they will take, um, and some of them will will, will be successful.